His power is the foundation for you to make it all the way through life. So here's the truth you need to pack up and take home with you. When the all-powerful one is with you, then all power is available to you. And not only did Jesus overcome death, but he has also overcome every other problem we face. You see, the Bible tells us in Colossians 2, 13 to 15, Christ forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Listen to what God is telling you in this passage. When Jesus died on the cross, he made a way to remove your sin. Once upon a time, a wealthy man named Mensa lived happily with his wife and his only son. Mensa and his wife worked hard and planned well so that when they passed away, their only son would inherit all they owned. But sadly, Mensa's wife became ill and died suddenly. Grief-stricken at their loss, the father and son became inseparable. They loved each other deeply and encouraged each other for comfort and support. In fact, Mensa and his son were so close, the other relatives in the family became very jealous. They did not like the fact that Mensa and his son were inseparable. Many of the relatives wanted to get close to Mensa themselves so that they could have a chance to share in some of his wealth. And so it was that one day Mensa's son was murdered on their farm. The murder was never solved, but it seemed likely that some of the jealous relatives had conspired to kill Mensa's only son. Mensa was so heartbroken, he decided to bury his son's body in the compound of their home. And every day for the rest of his life, Mensa would go and visit his son's grave. He would talk to his son, and he would talk about his son to anyone who cared to listen. In fact, because of his devotion to his late son, the son was hated even more in death than he was in life. The extended family members were so angry. Well, one day it came to pass that Mensa himself also died and was buried. Since the man had no close relatives to succeed him, he had left a will, a legal document, that designated how all his properties were to be distributed amongst his family members. And after burying Mensa, the day finally came for the will to be read. The extended family members gathered, and their lawyer announced that he would now read the will. Everybody was silent to pay close attention to the lawyer. They all wanted to know what they would get. And so the lawyer began. The first property to be distributed is the son's grave. Mensa's son's grave. Anyone at all who requests it can receive Mensa's son's grave. Well, at first, there was confusion on everyone's face. They murmured amongst themselves and began to grow agitated. Finally, one of the family members mustered the courage and said to the lawyer, This is ridiculous. Who inherits a grave? But the lawyer persisted, Who will take the grave of Mensa's son? There was silence. Then a voice in the back shouted, We want the real property. No one wants the son's grave. But the lawyer persisted. Will someone take the son's grave? Who will stand and agree to take the son's grave? Another voice shouted, We didn't come for the dead son. What would we do with the son's grave? We came for the property. We want the land, the building, the jewelry, the vehicles. Get on and read the will. Stop wasting our time. But finally, a voice came from the very back. I will take the son's grave. Everyone turned around to see who was speaking, and it was none other than Mensa's long-time gardener and steward. 
the family head sitting in the front row shouted, what do you want with Mensah's son's grave? You're not even a family member. But the steward stood up and said, I'm not a family member, but I did love the son. I watched him grow up from childhood. We used to play together in the garden after his mother died. I would like to honor the son and tend to his grave until I die. All right, the family head said. You're not a family member, but you can have the son's grave. Besides, none of us want it. We all agree this man, this gardener, this steward should have the son's grave. Now let's get on with reading of the will. Yes, everyone shouted, give him the son. Give us the property. But the lawyer shocked everyone. Because he then shook his head and declared, I'm sorry, but the reading of the will is over. What? What are you talking about? People started shouting. What about the rest of the property? What about the land and the building, the jewelry and the vehicle? Shouted the family head. I'm sorry, the lawyer said. But there is a secret stipulation in the will. I was forbidden by law to read it to you until now. But only the son's grave would be distributed as inheritance. Whoever agreed to accept the son's grave would inherit the entire estate. The man who took the son's grave now gets everything. I hereby award Mensa's entire estate to the gardener. And so it was that the only one who loved the son received the entire inheritance. There is a powerful lesson for all of us inside the fable of Mensa and his son's grave. You see, just like Mensa's relatives, many people today are seeking the blessings of God. They want the power of God and the favor of God and the money from God to sustain them throughout life. But the secret to receiving the blessings of God is only found in his son, Jesus Christ. When you embrace God's son, you inherit all the riches of God's kingdom. When you choose Jesus above everything, you have all you need to make it all the way through this life. That's the message in our sermon today. We're going to discover the powerful promise available to anyone who will embrace the Son of God, Jesus Christ. But before we learn more, let us bow our heads and pray. Almighty and everlasting Father, today we ask you to focus our eyes on the only thing that truly matters, a relationship with your Son, Jesus Christ. As we're here seeking one thing or the other, chasing after the things of this life, Help us to stop today. Help us to listen to your word today. Help us to learn from you today and to long for you and desire you more than any other thing. We submit to you now, I bind every voice of the devil that would come to steal the seed of the word out of our heart. Every spirit that would come to deceive or disturb or distract us, I command you to be silent. In the name of Jesus, I loose the power of the Holy Spirit to come and fall upon every heart and every mind and every soul that we might love you supremely and be with you forever. We thank you by faith in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. I invite you to take a moment now. Join your faith with mine. Put your hand on your chest and pray after me. Lord Jesus, speak to my heart. Change my life. Manifest your glory in me. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, hello, friends, and welcome to Truth For Today. It's a joy to be here with you in the powerful presence of the Almighty God. Today, we're concluding our sermon series titled Waymaker. For the last month, we've been on a journey to discover the truth about Jesus, our Waymaker, as we focused on the resurrection of our Lord. We've learned that the Waymaker always makes a way. No matter who you are, no matter where you're at, at, uh, no matter where you need to go, the way maker has made a way for you. If you believe it, say amen. See, the fact is, God's plan is comprehensive. Just tell your neighbor, God's plan is comprehensive. God's plan at the resurrection was for Jesus, the way maker, to get us all the way through life. That's why when he was leaving earth to go and sit on his throne in heaven, Jesus gave his disciples very, very important 
and vital keys that would carry them all the way through life. And it's the same message he gives to all of us today. In his parting words, in his farewell speech, he shows us the truths we need to make it all the way through this life so that we can be reunited in the next life with our Lord Jesus Christ. Now to discover those keys, we prepared sermon notes. We do this every week so that you can follow along with the message and take the Word of God home with you to learn more later on. You'll find our notes available free of charge on my website and my social media pages. And there at the top of your notes is our scripture text for today. It's a simple passage taken from the book of the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. Now receive the word of the Lord. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. May the Lord bless the reading of his word to your heart today, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. These famous words are often called the Great Commission. They're called the Great Commission because they are Jesus' final command to his church to take the gospel to the whole world. Yet, interestingly enough, they are much more than a Great Commission. In fact, these are the words of the Waymaker to show us all how to make it all the way through life. So let's take a few minutes and discover three truths to see you all the way through life. And here's your first truth today. The way maker has all power. Somebody say all power. Listen to how Jesus begins his powerful final words on earth. I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. In other words, our ability to make it all the way through life is founded on the fact that Jesus the way maker has all power and all authority. This is what the Apostle Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. Under the fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit, he said in Acts 2.24, God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible possible for death to keep its hold on him. If death could not defeat him, then there is nothing else in heaven or earth that could defeat Jesus. And if nothing can defeat him, nothing can defeat those who belong to him. It was impossible for death to hold him. And it is impossible for any power anywhere to hold anyone who belongs to Jesus Christ. That's why in the very next verse, Peter quoted the words of David and said, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Just say that after me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. See, God is always with us. With his presence by our side, you will not be shaken. His presence gives you the ability to endure. We're not alone. And the one who lives in us is the one who has all authority. His power is the foundation for you to make it all the way through life. So here's the truth you need to pack up and take home with you. When the all-powerful one is with you, then all power is available to you. And not only did Jesus overcome death, but he has also overcome every other problem we face. You see, the Bible tells us in Colossians 2, 13 to 15, Christ forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Listen to what God is telling you in this passage. When Jesus died on the cross, he made a way to remove your sin. When he died on the cross, he disarmed the devil and took away his weapons. He brought about a permanent and a public victory over Satan. And though sin had power over man, Jesus broke that power. And though the devil held man captive, Jesus has broken that power. And when we come to his empty tomb, there 
is nothing more we need to do. The victory is already won. The powers facing us are already defeated. Somebody shout victory. That's why Romans 6, 9 says, Christ was raised from the dead, and we know that he cannot die again. Death has no power over him now. And the good news is not only that Jesus triumphs over all, it's that his triumph is permanent. Jesus reigns forever and ever. For Philippians 2, 9 to 11 says, Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name that is above all other names. Hallelujah. That at the name of Jesus, not the name of Mohammed, not the name of some idol, not the name of Buddha, not the name of a government, not the name of a politician, not the name of a doctor or a scientist, but at the name of Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare, Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And I stand here unashamed, I stand here unapologetic to declare by faith, Jesus Christ is Lord. Somebody shout, Jesus. Jesus Christ is Lord. Every government will bow before Jesus. Every power, every ruler, every corporation, every billionaire, every movie star, everybody will bow before Jesus. Every demon spirit, every witch and wizard, every idol in your village, every belief, every religion will bow before Jesus. Though men may try, they cannot stop the power of Jesus Christ. He has all power. Men have tried to stop Jesus, but they always fail. More than 60 years ago, the ruler of China, Chairman Mao Zedong, began attacking Christianity in China. He drove out 10,000 Christian missionaries. He imprisoned pastors. He forbade the preaching of the gospel. He burned all the Christian seminary libraries. And Mao Zedong declared, Christianity will not survive in China. But today, Mao is dead, and there are more than 58 million Christians in China, and the church in China continues to grow. Today, in the very city where Chairman Mao Zedong attended senior high school, in the very city where he embraced communism, a huge new church exists. The Xingxia Church is a 260-foot-tall church building in Changsha, the city where Mao Zedong embraced communism. This Protestant church is more than twice the size of Mao's biggest statue in China, which stands just a few miles away. Mao Zedong tried to wipe out the church, but today the church in China is bigger and stronger than ever. For there is no one greater than Jesus, and when he is in you, you have his power. So here's the truth you need to pack up and take home with you to carry you all the way through life. God's yes always overrules man's no. That's the lesson we can learn from the powerful true story of a Dutch woman named Corrie ten Boom. Corrie was a watchmaker living in Harlem, Holland, when the Germans invaded her nation and during World War II and conquered it. Once in power, the Nazis began to persecute the Jewish people. Now, Corey and her family were lovers of Christ. And when they saw the persecution of the Jewish people, they stepped in to help rescue them. Corey and her family began taking in Jewish refugees and hid them in their home. They were able to save countless lives. But then on February 28, 1944, a Dutch informant named John Vogel told the Nazis about the Ten Booms and their rescue effort to the Jews. At around 12.30 p.m. that afternoon, the Nazis arrested the entire Ten Boom family. Corey, her sister Betsy, her father, her brother, and her nephew were all taken and sentenced to Nazi prison camps. Eventually, all four of Corey's relatives died in the prison camps. But then... Just when it looked hopeless, just when they wanted to execute Corey, she was miraculously released from prison. 
One week later, every single woman her age was executed in the gas chamber. Just in the nick of time, when the enemy had planned to wipe out the entire family, Corey was released. She later learned that her release had been a mistake. It was a clerical error. She wasn't supposed to be freed. She was supposed to be executed. But when man said die, God said live. Man's no was overruled by God's yes. That's why the Bible says in Romans 8, 31 to 34, what shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one, for God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one, for Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he's sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading, interceding, and praying for us. So consider the message in this powerful passage from God's word. God is for you. He's always with you. And God with you is greater than the world against you. God is on my side. He gave his son for me. Jesus died for me. Jesus rose from the dead for me. And if he gave his life for me, how much more will he do for me now? That's why no matter what you're facing, you are more than a conqueror. You are an overcomer through the one who loves you. Whatever you're passing through today is temporary. Whatever trouble or wahala you're facing is only temporary. This trial has come to pass. It hasn't come to stay. It doesn't matter the nature of your problem. It doesn't matter what you're going through. It won't last for anything you are passing through that is opposing God's kingdom will not last. All the troubles and all the difficulties in this life are only temporary. And I speak to anyone today who's facing sickness. This sickness will be healed in Jesus' name. I speak to anyone facing pain and heartbreak. This pain will not last, but I speak healing and comfort and life to you. Someone facing discouragement, I speak to you today. It's only momentary. You will smile again, for weeping may endure for a night, but joy, joy comes in the morning. Confusion, setbacks, delays, all these are temporary. Attacks at your working place, trouble in your home, they're temporary, but we belong to a kingdom that is triumphant forever. God's love lasts forever. God's power lasts forever. Somebody say forever. And even while everything around us can be shaken, that is shaking, God is building a people who are firmly in his kingdom. And we can never be shaken or moved. God is raising up an army of people. He's raising up an army of people on truth for today. He's raising up a people who will not fear when trouble comes. He's raising up a people who will not hide in terror, but will rise up with the good news of the gospel, the good news of his kingdom, his power and glory. God is building such a people for Jesus paid too high a price just to get you out of trouble for a moment and have you go back again. Jesus paid too high a price for your temporary setbacks to become permanent. He paid that price so that we could participate with him in his victory. Jesus shares his victory with you today so that you can share his purpose with him. And that's our second way to make it all the way through life. The way maker gives us a purpose. Somebody say purpose. You see, Jesus continues in verse 19 and says, therefore, everybody say therefore, therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations. So first, Jesus proclaims he has all power. Then he informs us that God has given us a purpose. We're not here simply to enjoy. We're not here just to receive power. You will never find true satisfaction and fulfillment in life until you let the power of God drive you to fulfill your purpose. Because I'm speaking to somebody today, you have been saved to serve. Your purpose in life is to give yourself away. 
And that is what will carry you through. When you have a purpose, you can endure trials. When you have a purpose, you can endure setbacks. When you have a purpose, you can make the sacrifice. No matter what you feel or what you face, your purpose motivates you. And some of us today are discouraged because we've lost sight of our purpose. Some of you are feeling like giving up because you've forgotten that God has given you a purpose. And Jesus said in Mark 8, 35, only those who give away their lives for my sake and the good news will ever know what it means to really live. And if you're just living for this life, you're missing out. If you're just living for the things of this earth, you're losing. That's the lesson we can learn from the true story of a couple that lost nearly everything a few years ago. Tanner Broadwell and Nikki Walsh had a dream. They wanted to buy a boat and live on their boat and sail around the world. So in 2017, they quit their jobs, sold all their property and possessions, and invested it all into a sailing boat. They lived on their boat for several months in Tarpon Springs, Florida, USA, as they prepared themselves to sail around the world. They wanted to visit Europe and Africa and Asia. And finally, after a few months of preparation, they felt ready for their first trip. Everything they'd done to invest in this trip was now set. They'd stocked up on food and supplies, and they set off for their first destination in the Caribbean. But nothing prepared Tanner and Nikki for what happened next. For two days into their trip, their boat sank. Everything in the boat vanished. They made it out alive, but they lost everything. All they could keep was their dog and the clothes on their back. After selling all their belongings and investing their entire lives into this boat, everything was now gone. They had their dog, a few clothes, $90, and nowhere to go. And that's how life is. Everything in this world will pass away. All the possessions we work for, everything we've invested in, everything we've built up, all the hard work, all the labor, all the blood, sweat, and tears, all the degrees we've earned, all the awards we've won, all that we've striven for, it will all be gone in a moment. It will sink into a bottomless pit. And if you don't live for God's eternal purposes, you won't make it through this life. You'll get to the end and you will be sunk. But eternal purpose gives us strength in tough times. Eternal purpose motivates you to keep going when you want to quit. Eternal purpose makes your life meaningful. And our eternal purpose is to align with Jesus and unite with him to reach people. A lot of people today want power for their own display. There are some so-called men of God that will do anything to get power so that men will give them money and men will give them acclaim and men will give them praise and their name will be known. But I declare to you, God's power is not for your purpose. God's power is not for your pride. God's power is not for your display. God's power comes for his purpose. That's why he says, therefore, when I give you power, therefore, when I give you authority, therefore, go. The therefore is a reason. It's therefore. The power is there for you to win others to Christ. Let me be clear. God's miracle power is not a substitute for your obedience. The great commission will only be fulfilled as we go in the obedience to his command. God is not going to send angels. He's not going to write the gospel in the clouds. He's not going to fill our churches unless we get up and go. We've been given power. We've been given victory. We've been given a purpose to make it all the way through. And the closer we cling to God's purpose, the more of God's power we will enjoy. Hallelujah. Because you can always expect God's power whenever you are obeying God's plan. You can always expect God's power when you're aligned with God's purpose. So when you're in need of God's power, when you want God's power to make it through a tough situation, ask yourself, what is God's purpose in my life? What is God working in my life? How can I align myself with God's 
purpose in this situation. For whenever you discover God's purpose and begin to pursue it, you will have the power you need. Somebody say amen. See, that's the lesson we can learn from a Ghanaian hero named Richard Apia Akoto. Richard is a JSS teacher in the Ashanti region here in Ghana. He caught the world's attention from a little village called Bitanase when a photo of him appeared on social media. With just a blackboard and a talent for drawing, Richard explained in detail to his students the secrets of Microsoft Word. You see, in Bitanase, in the JSS, they did not have computers. There was no laptop. There was nothing he could use to show the students. So Richard took a blackboard and started to draw a computer screen. Listen to his words. I wanted to teach my students how to launch Microsoft Word, Richard said, but I had no computer to show them. I had to do my best. So I decided to draw what the screen looks like on the blackboard with chalk. Well, the photograph of Richard's chalkboard drawing earned numerous headlines and worldwide admiration. Following the social media buzz, people and organizations donated desktops and laptop computers to a school. And in 2018, Microsoft flew Richard Apia free of charge to Singapore to attend the annual Microsoft Educators Exchange. There, he received a standing ovation when he appeared on stage. The Vice President for Worldwide Education at Microsoft, Mr. Anthony Salcito, praised Richard Akato Apia, for inspiring the world. In a small village, without any computers, facing hardship and difficulty, Richard aligned himself with his God-given purpose, and God gave him power and popularity and progress. See, friends, the fact is this. If you will pursue your purpose, even when it seems difficult, then God will always make a way through for you. So here's the truth you need to pack up and take home with you. You will never lack the power of God in your life when you align yourself with the purpose of God. In fact, the only way to experience the power of God is to unite with Christ. That's why Jesus said in John 15, 4 to 8, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves uh, to be my disciples. And Jesus here compels us to remain united with him. You can no more fulfill your purpose than a branch uh, can fulfill its fruit-bearing purpose when it's cut off from the tree. To be united with Christ brings us to our third way to make it through. The way maker gives us his presence. First, he declares, I have all power. Second, he declares that power is yours when you align with my purpose. And third, he says, when you come into my presence, when you tap into my power to fulfill my purpose, then my presence will be with you. Jesus concludes uh, this passage with these words in verse 20. And be sure of this. Tell your neighbor, be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So the last key to the way through life is the presence of the resurrected Jesus in us. See, the cross was a means to an end. The resurrection was a means to an end. The ultimate goal of all that Jesus suffered and all that Jesus did was so that he could dwell in us and we could abide in him. The ultimate goal of the cross and the empty tomb is Jesus in you. This is what makes Christianity different from every other religion. This is what makes Christianity different from every other faith and creed. It is Christ's presence in us that separates us from everything else. That's why in Exodus 33, 16, Moses said, Your presence, Lord, among us sets your people and me apart from all other people on the earth. And I declare to you today, what will set you apart in me? 
ministry, what will set you apart in your faith, what will set you apart in your life, in your family, in your job, in your community, is Christ's presence in you because his presence gives you grace. His presence gives you strength. His presence gives you the power and the anointing to make it all the way through life. Somebody say, I'm going to make it. But here's the problem. We often tie our faith in God's presence to our circumstances. We are in error because when things are going well and we feel his presence, we're in a pleasant place. It's easy to believe, oh, God is with me. When we get into the church and the music is flowing and the choir is singing and we feel goosebumps on our back and the tingles start and we're moving back and forth, we say, oh, I feel God's presence. But when you're stuck in traffic in go slow on Monday morning and your wife is nagging you and your boss is not happy with you, you say, what happened to God? When things get dark and the way gets tough, we tend to doubt God's presence. We start to believe God has left us. We feel abandoned. So our faith goes down and our courage goes down and our attitude starts to change. But if you're going to make it through life, you have to know that God is with you always in the good times and in the tough times. See, the truth is, Jesus doesn't leave you in the dark places. He leads you through the dark places. That's why David said in Psalm 23, 1 to 4, The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you, you are with me. The same God that led David by the still waters is the God who led him through the dark valley. The same good shepherd who took him to the green pastures is the same good shepherd who took him through the darkest valley to pass through the shadow of death. And when you follow the presence of the good shepherd, he will always lead you through. He doesn't lead you to stay. He doesn't camp in the dark valley. He walks you through. Follow his ways. Follow the way maker. Follow his presence and you will come out the other side. For he is the way maker and he makes a way through for all of us. One night, a Christian brother had a dream. He dreamed he was walking along the seashore on the beach with the Lord next to him. Across the sky flashed scenes from his life when he graduated from senior high school, when he had his marriage, when he got his baptism. But as he looked at the dream and saw his life flashing across the sky as he walked with the Lord, he noticed that two sets of footprints were in the sand. One was his and one belonged to Jesus. But when the last scene of his life flashed before him, he looked back at the footprints in the sand, and he noticed that many times along the path of his life, the two sets of footprints became one. And he noticed that when the two sets of footprints became one, it was during the difficult, dark, disappointing days of his life. His lowest and saddest moments in life, there was only one set of footprints. And this bothered him. So he talked to the Lord and asked God about it. He said, Jesus, you said that once I decided to follow you, you would walk with me all the way. But I noticed that during the tough, troublesome times in my life, there's only one set of footprints. I don't understand why when I needed you the most, you left me alone. Then Jesus said to him, My precious child, I love you and I would never leave you. During your times of trial and suffering, when you see only one set of footprints walking along the sand through your life, it was then that I lifted you up on my shoulder and carried you. The one set of footprints were mine as I carried you through the dark valley. So I say to you today, do not give up. 
keep following the good shepherd. In every trial, keep following Jesus. Even when it doesn't feel good, even when it doesn't make sense, even when it's frustrating and inconvenient, you've got to follow the good shepherd. He's leading you, but you must follow. See, Jesus doesn't lead the sheep who wander away. He leads the one under his care and control. And when you follow the good shepherd, you will never, ever lose his presence. If you don't have God's presence in your life, it is you that has moved away. Don't let trials separate you from God. Let trials move you closer. For the good news for everyone today is that we can live continually in his love. He promised his presence to us every day, every moment, all day, to the end of days. He's with us in the good days. He's with us on the tough days. He's with us in the green pasture and the dark valley. It is his presence that will carry you all the way through life. That's why Romans 8 says this. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity, or are persecuted, or hungry, or destitute, or in danger, or threatened with death. No! Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I'm convinced uh, that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, neither angels, nor demons, neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed nothing in all all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. And in this list, Paul covers every hindrance you might be facing today. Paul lists famine and nakedness. Those things represent financial trouble. Maybe you're facing business collapse or debts you can't pay. Maybe you lack school fees or house rent and things are so tight you're skipping meals. But even that cannot separate you from God. God's love in the face of famine, in the face of nakedness, you are victorious. What about danger or sword? Paul says even that cannot separate you from the love of God. Right now in Nigeria, in Kenya, in Iraq, in Syria, in Somalia, Iran, in Mali, in Chad, people who love Jesus are facing persecution. But even the threat of death cannot separate us from the love of God. The Bible says no, no in all these things things in every circumstance, in every situation, no matter what you're passing through today, nothing can separate you from God's love. You may not feel like it, but it's not based on feelings. It's based on the truth. Jesus is the way maker. Jesus is the way into God's presence. Jesus is the way out of bondage and pain. Jesus is the way back from disappointment and doubt and dryness. And Jesus is the way through. He's the way through with his power. He's the way through with his purpose. And he's the way through with his presence every day in your life. So I speak to you today, to everyone watching and listening, and I loose the power of God upon you. I loose the resurrection victory of Christ in you. I loose the revelation of God's love upon you. I speak to every obstacle, every attack, every situation of hardship you're facing today. And I command every voice of the devil to be silent. I command the enemy to cease and desist and I loose the power of God, the presence of God to fulfill the purpose of God in the people of God today. Lord, we give you the praise. We give you the glory. We thank you by faith that nothing can separate us. You have all power. So Lord, we surrender to your purpose. We will receive your power that we might go and proclaim your love. Only let us go in your presence. Let us walk in your presence. Help us make it through with your presence, uh, Lord, that we might fulfill your purpose in your power. We thank you and we bless you today in the mighty name of Jesus. God says it's going to be all right. God is speaking to somebody right now. He's telling you, don't give up. Don't get discouraged. Dry your tears. Weeping may come for a night, but joy is coming in the morning. There's a breakthrough coming for your life as you pursue God's power. 
power and purpose and presence. God richly bless you. I'm praying for you. Don't forget, you can send your prayer request. Just send me a message on Facebook or on YouTube or through my website at our uh, email address. In whatever means you can, let's talk. Let's pray. Let's see God carry you through. God richly bless you. I love you. Until next time.